Hey, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm your host, Howard Jacobson. Before we get to today's show, a quick reminder that this podcast is free for everyone and supported by those who can afford it. So uh, if you have found this podcast a useful companion during 2020, and you'd like to see it continue through 2021, I would invite you to go to plantyourself.com slash gift. If you are in a position where you have the means to support something that means something to you and hopefully uh, you think is doing good in the world. You can use PayPal or Patreon. You can make a one time contribution or become an ongoing sustaining patron of the show. And if funds are too tight for you to show your appreciation in a monetary sense, you can still leave a review of the Plant Yourself podcast on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. That also helps us a great deal. All right. On to today's episode. This is the Plant Yourself Podcast. I'm Howard Jacobson of PlantYourself.com, the Big Change Program, and Well Start Health. This podcast is part of my mission to help you live an active and awesome life. So my guest today is Dr. Neil Barnard, the founder and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. As he pointed out, it's far too big and influential to be still called a committee. Uh, with thousands and thousands of members, with a large staff, with uh, reach and influence uh, that has changed our world. Uh, but it still sounds like, you know, 15 grumpy doctors sitting in a, in a boardroom somewhere. Uh, well, you know, who, who among us hasn't outgrown our childhood name? Um, and he is the founder of the Barnard Medical Center in the Washington, D.C. area. He's also the author of a crazy number of books given his full-time dedication to the practice of medicine and to improving the practice of medicine by making it more evidence-based, by giving people information about the power of diet, and by advocating and agitating and maneuvering politically and building alliances to get animal cruelty out of medical education. He tells a story in our conversation about Doctors learning how to do injections by just bringing in dogs and just practicing giving drugs to dogs that drugs that the dogs didn't need or want or ever asked for. And combining all of this with a love of our planet and a sincere desire to see us thrive on it instead of polluting ourselves into oblivion the way we have been doing with uh, animal agriculture in particular. So I have wanted to talk to Dr. Barnard since I started Plant Yourself way back in 2014. And last week, my wish was fulfilled. And we even got it on video, which you can see at plantyourself.com slash 291 or search for it on YouTube. Just in case you think, you know, maybe I just uh, stole the audio of uh, Dr. Barnard from like Rich Roll and just spliced in my questions. No, we actually talked, him and me. And we talked about his journey, his early research, the formation of PCRM, the evidence for a plant-based diet to prevent and reverse most of our chronic diseases. And Dr. Barnard is one of those people you listen to for a few minutes and you're like, yeah, this makes more sense than anything I've ever heard. And also about using the tragedy of Hurricane Florence um, in North Carolina in particular as a teachable moment about climate change and animal agriculture and also about the upcoming kickstart that PCRM is sponsoring in my neck of the woods, the Triangle of North Carolina. Before we get to it, a couple of brief announcements. And these are the same announcements I've been making for a couple of weeks, but this is like the last week to make them. So I'm going to make them and I'm going to make them good. If you want to sign up for the next Well Start Health program, which begins on October 15th, that's a Monday, that's next Monday, this coming Monday, please go to wellstarthealth.com slash program. You can read about it. You can apply. You will get me. You will get Josh Lajani. You will get Kevin Davis. And you will get a surprise mystery coach. We've just brought someone else on board. We haven't signed all the paperwork yet, so I can't reveal her name. But she is awesome. And if you would like a 12-week virtual health retreat to crush your bad habits, to stomp the sloth that wants to keep you on the couch and not working out, to uh, overcome peer pressure, social pressure, family pressure, old habits, old cravings, 
you know, I've had so many people come and say, we've tried all these things, we've tried all these programs, we've tried all these protocols, and yours was the first one that worked. And it's because the coaches have all had DHIs themselves. Um, no, that's not uh, where you get pulled over by a cop for um, swerving in the road. A DHI is a dramatic health improvement. So we understand what it takes. And we create community. We weave and build community, which is the most important thing. And we've got tons of videos. We have live uh, classes. We have real-time SMS texting with your coaches if you get into a jam and you need a little bit of quick assistance. We have group discussions. We have goals that you check off, a, a robust online platform. Really, I think this is the best thing out there, and I've studied a lot of it. Uh, in putting together this program. So again, if you're interested, wellstarthealth.com slash program. Now, last week, Josh and Kevin and I held a live coaching demo. We asked uh, from my email list people who wanted to be coached, and we got about uh, 20 people who volunteered, and we ended up getting about 10 of them on a live video call, and we did our thing for an hour and 49 minutes. And I was frankly quite nervous because, you know, in a real coaching situation, there is privacy, there is confidentiality. And here these people knew that their most um, intimate and scary struggles were going to be shared with the world. I was also concerned that it wasn't a real group. It was just sort of a one-off um, but it was amazing. And as soon as we got into it, like all of those doubts fell away. People had um, insights, made transformations, made commitments to change. We'll have to see, of course, what sticks and what doesn't. But if you want to get a sense of what being part of the program is like, you can watch the entire video at plantyourself.com slash demo, all lowercase D-E-M-O. And if you'd like to become a health coach, if you'd like to learn how we do what we do, we're offering a second run of the Well Start Health Coach Training Program. That'll begin end of October. Just email me and let me know you're interested, and I'll put you on the notification list. That email is hj at plantyourself.com. Okay, so now let's get to today's interview. Without further ado, Dr. Neil Barnard, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Yeah, you got you got a lot going on as as always. Uh, <laughs> I guess so. So I, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, the upcoming Health Fest in in Durham, North Carolina. But but um, while I had the chance to um, to have this conversation with you, I would love to. I'm just so curious about the trajectory of of your life and your story. And I wonder, you know, you're, you're one of many uh, plant-based luminaries who started out on a dairy farm, <laughs> right? So, um, well, not exactly. No. Um, uh, Colin Campbell grew up on a dairy farm and then Caldwell Esselstyn's family raised cattle. Um, and it's, you know, I guess, I guess uh, when you see it up close and personal, it makes it maybe um, a little more striking and even perhaps more objectionable. Uh, in my case, uh, my dad uh, grew up in the cattle business, and his dad, and his, as far back as I can trace, really, and, and same with my uncles and my cousins. Um, however, um, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and my father uh, took quite a dislike to the cattle business, and he left it. Huh. And yeah, yeah, he left it, and he went to. He ended up going to medical school, and he then became the diabetes expert for Fargo and Eastern North Dakota and Western Minnesota, and. Um, but that's just as relevant um, in a couple ways. One is we still ate like we were in the cattle business. And then secondly, um, despite the fact that diabetes was his whole career, I never once, once heard him say that anyone ever got better. It was always um, sort of fighting a, a losing battle and against this disease that was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so um, after I got into my uh, medical work. Um, I'm happy to say that the trajectory changed. Mm. Oh, I, I did not know that. Um, I guess at that time to be a diabetes expert was there were all these new um, new medicines and new delivery mechanisms for insulin. There was 
like synthetic insulins. You didn't have to rely on pigs. What was what was his what was his contributions? What was his work? What did diabetes um, cutting edge diabetes care look like in those days? Um, I have to say, I, I really think it was much more primitive than it is now. Um, uh, well, maybe that's not the right word because what, what has happened since that time is just uh, this proliferation of new medications where you can't turn on the TV for five minutes without another commercial about a new medication that you ought to take. Um, most all of that is unnecessary, I have to say. Back in his day, it was sort of insulin and insulin. Hmm. Um, and that's mostly what they relied on. Uh, but since that time, there have been more uh, newer tests. I mean, they, what they were doing is they were checking urine, blood, u- urine sugars and sometimes blood sugars and and uh, things have changed. But but the, the big thing that has changed, obviously, is our work where uh, we bring people in and we're focusing not on a new medicine. Uh, we're focusing on on the cause of the disease. And the cause of diabetes is the accumulation of fat droplets inside the muscle and liver cells that causes insulin to not work anymore. And so we can reverse that by changing the diet. And if you get the animal products out of the diet, there's no animal fat anymore. And if you keep the oils really low, then the fat that has been building up inside those muscle cells and liver cells, that fat starts to dissipate. And suddenly insulin starts working again. The patient says, wow, what's going on? My blood sugars are falling and I don't need so much medicine. And eventually they come off their medicine in many cases. Um, and if you get to them early, you got a good shot at reversing this disease. Yeah. Did you ever, did you have a chance to have this conversation with your dad? Uh, not exactly. Um, the research that we did um, that was particularly influential really was published in 2006. Um, that was our NIH uh, trial. It was a head-to-head test of uh, a vegan diet versus a more conventional diet. And at that point, he was already pretty well up in years. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay, so I, I, I saw that you um, went into psychiatry when you, you decided to become a doctor. So what was, what was your interest there? That was all I cared about. Um, when, when I was in college, I was studying psychology. And I have to tell you, I had no interest in medicine whatsoever. My, and I think this came from my father. Um, he, he, I don't think he really enjoyed the practice, especially. Um, and as I said, patients didn't get better. They just got worse. Um, and, you know, I, I think he was helping them as much as he could and trying to prevent them from having the most serious complications. But there wasn't really anything in it that I found especially interesting. It struck me as uncreative and, and mundane. Um, but when I was in college, I studied uh, human psychology, and I found it fascinating. And so I went to medical school with only one goal in mind, and I was going to become a psychiatrist. Hmm. And, I was, and, and I did. I was really interested in the human mind and how mental illness began and what we could do to fix that. And that was the only thing that I cared about. Uh, however, um, in my first year of practice, uh, after I got out of my residency, I was practicing in New York. And I had a busy job. Uh, during the day, I was running a psychiatric ward at St. Vincent's Hospital. But at night, um, in the evening, I had a, a consulting job where I would see patients who were medically ill. Um, a patient in the ICU, for example, who was delirious, uh, medically ill with psychiatric complications. Um, a person with HIV, where the HIV infected their brain and caused um, Uh, psychiatric complications of this medical disease. And as time went on, I started to get um, an impression that in medicine, and and still to a great degree now, we weren't doing anything about the heart attack until it came into the emergency room door. We weren't doing anything about cancer until it showed up on a mammogram or on a digital exam or something like that. And I started thinking, why don't we, why don't we prevent these diseases? <laughs> why, why, why are we doing something to stop the, the heart attack or the cancer from happening? And um, I also was troubled about the way research was going. It was this endless search for a new pill um, and nothing about um, very little prevention research and very little nutrition research. And I also thought the research was cruel, that we were abusing animals in various ways to try to give cancer to animals or diabetes to animals, rather than doing research in ways that were ethical and that would 
get us to where we want to go. So I set up this organization that has the worst possible name, uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which nobody could ever remember. But that was my idea. I was going to have maybe 15 doctors be our committee. And we would weigh in on the issues of the day, and we would support uh, people who are doing uh, their own kind of activism in this area. And that was my idea. Uh, the only thing was we started to really grow a lot. And we're not really a committee anymore because you can't fit 175,000 people <laughs> into a committee room. But, um, but now we do research studies um, on all the things that I didn't want to get involved in when I was younger. Um, on diabetes and cholesterol issues and weight problems. And I have to say the research has been, I think, very important um, and has shown some quite remarkable things. And then we also do advocacy and policy work and lots of other stuff. Right. So I'm fascinated. I'm hearing a kind of a thread throughout that, that, that you're sort of an intellectual rebel. Like you, you go into a field and you just immediately start looking for what's wrong with it. Does that does that sound um, does that sound maybe, fair? Well, maybe, but but not through any kind of personality disorder. I don't <laughs> think. Um, and the idea was not to to rebel. Um, uh, I had a perfectly nice childhood and and wasn't necessarily a rebel by nature. Ex except, I mean, it is true. I mean, I grew up in the '60s when um, there was a lot of rebelliousness in the air about war and about racism and about prejudice. Um, and the work that, that, that I have been doing isn't with an intention to try to rebel, but, it's in, but it was, is with an intention of trying to make things right. Um, and I'll never forget when I was an intern, uh, I was on call every third night. You worked every day and every third night you had to work all night also. And I remember several times I was called to the fifth floor south of the hospital, and, and there was a woman there who I still remember. She was an uh, elderly woman who was, she needed an amputation. She had diabetes, um, and the diabetes caused tremendous um, sores in her feet. Um, she couldn't feel things, and so she would get a, a, a foot ulcer that wouldn't, and it wouldn't heal, and she had gangrene, and she had to have her foot amputated, but she refused the operation. And so our job was to try to keep her alive with intravenous antibiotics. And in the middle of the night, the IVs would always clot off, and they would call me at 3 a.m. to restart her IV. And I'd go into her room, and she would curse me out a blue streak about, you know, that I'd have to stick her again and start her IV. Um, and we kind of got to know each other a little bit um, in this unfortunate scenario. And we did keep her alive. Um, and she, she didn't get her amputation at, at that time. Um, but in the course of this, I just thought, what in the heck are we doing here? Um, my choice is to hospitalize you for six weeks of antibiotics. If we can't, if we don't, can't succeed, you're going to lose your foot. Um, this is primitive. Um, so the goal is not to rebel. The goal is to fix this. What, what's wrong with this is that she had diabetes not because she had a metformin deficiency or a deficiency of Invokana or these drugs that you see. She had, she had diabetes because of eating habits, and she never knew it, and no doctor ever explained it to her. And if they talked to her about diet, it would have been don't eat bread or don't eat too much rice because that makes your blood sugar rise. That's idiotic and old-fashioned. And we have to change all that. So that's what I want to do. And when, and when it comes to, um, uh, say, the use of animals in research, uh, when I was in medical school, we had a mandatory dog lab. Um, you're going to learn how, uh, how to use medications, and the way you do it is you take a live, healthy dog, tape them on a table, um, tape them down, in, insert uh, an IV in a vein, give the dog various drugs, write down what the drugs do, and then you kill them. And I, I wasn't rebellious, but I said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I said, no way. I, yeah. um, well, I, I think you, you, you think that I think that rebellious is maybe not a compliment, but uh, yeah. no, but, but, and, and, you know, but the, the goal isn't to rebel. The goal is to fix things. Right. And so I'm happy to tell you, we, we fixed that. I said I would not kill a dog. And because I wouldn't do it, so I, I said I'm not going to participate in this lab at all. And because I wouldn't, there was another student who said, well, he's not going to do it. I won't do it. Mm. And then when I got out of training, I made a vow that I was going to get rid of those damn things. These dog labs, and I did. Um, we uh, eliminated 
the animal lab. That was the George Washington University. And then we worked with Harvard and Yale and Stanford and everybody. And um, finally, in 2016, there are no more, not just dog labs, there are no more animal labs of any kind in any medical school in the United States or Canada for the four years that go up to your MD degree. So, so that's a good thing because what that means is not only are you not you know, treating animals cruelly, but you're focusing on what really matters, which is compassionate treatment of medical patients and research that is focused on human biology. And that's where medicine needs to be. Right. And I want to, I want to get back to, to that question about research. I have lots of questions about your, um, your interest in research and the research you've carried out and where you see it going. But I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm so curious because you just sort of said, and then you know, and then I started this committee that I thought was going to be 15 people, and and it grew. Like at the same time as you, you're able to see things that are wrong, and and you know just to see that they're wrong. Like I can think of so many times in my life where I just accepted what was, and it took a long time, or it was a lot later, or someone had to raise my consciousness to the point where I looked back and said, yeah, I, I kind of knew that was wrong, but I didn't really, or I couldn't articulate it. But not only did you do that, but you also saw that organizations and institutions were the way forward to, to fix it. So what, what, what did you do with PCRM in the early days that, that, that allowed it to grow or helped it to grow? Well, I just, I reached out to anybody that, that I could. Um, it turns out there are a fair number of doctors who felt the same way I did. They had the same concerns. And so I just kept reaching out and I would call it various organizations um, that worked on nutrition or worked on animal protection or whatever. And I said, give, give me any doctors you have. Um, and uh, we just kind of grew from there. Um, and one advantage that I had is um, I, uh, I had a job in New York. I, I quit my job and I moved back down to Washington because I thought that'd be a better place for this work. And I worked half time um, running a clinic here in Washington. And then the other half of my time, I didn't take a paycheck. I just um, started this organization. I worked really hard to, to get it going. Um, and so it, it helps to live kind of a simple lifestyle because then you don't have to worry too much about mortgage payments and things like that. Uh -huh. So were you self-funding the organization? Because I, I know, you know, you, at this point you yeah, have a... Right. And initially, but uh, yes, but, but we had, I mean, I didn't have any staff, so there wasn't much to do. Um, but very soon I started to, to do direct mail and, and have um, people support us with uh, contributions that were pretty small at first, but they, they grew. Um, and then I was able to hire people to help me. And we now have about 100 employees here, um, mostly here in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. And you know, it's, it's been a good thing. Okay. So, so um, it sounds like at the beginning, the concerns were about animal cruelty um, leading to, you know, research methods leading to animal cruelty and also not leading to um, outcomes that were good for human beings and also an interest in preventing disease. But like, like those are two, two um, pathways that, that looking back, we see are both, you know, they're both connected to eating plants, not animals, veganism. When did those strands start to come together in your mind? Oh, no, right from the very beginning, because um, if you're not focusing on the nutritional causes of say a heart attack or diabetes. Um, what are you doing? You're, you're saying, gee, I have no idea how you got diabetes. I how did your heart attack occur? I have no idea. And then what do you do? Then you're doing research trying to figure out the, the cause of it. Um, very often that research was done on animals and was often cruel. Let's cause uh, heart disease or diabetes in animals. And it's a, it was a complete um, distraction from where we needed to go. And it, the problem was it also going the other direction. The more people were using animals, the more that they were neglecting the nutritional causes of things. And so I started to see this was, we really had to work both on the medical side and the research side. And in both cases, we have to focus on the cause. And so that was um, right from the very beginning, I wanted to, to tackle both issues. So focusing on the cause means food for the most part. Um, and the kinds of research that we need to do has to really be in the, in the human animal, not in a, mm. a rat or a mouse. Okay, but P PCRM, you started in 86? 85. Right? 85. What evidence was there at that point that you could look at and say animal foods cause disease? Um, we didn't have the research that we have done. 
at that time, and Dean Ornish hadn't shown his really brilliant and elegant work showing that you could reverse heart disease. But what we did have was we had um, uh, evidence, say, in, um, in areas like Japan, where the dietary staples were not a steak or a big chunk of fried chicken. The dietary staple in Japan was rice. And we had seen this dramatic thing that was happening right at that time uh, in the 1980s, that as Japan was westernizing its diet and meat was coming in and dairy was coming in for the first time, heart disease went up and cancer rates, uh, breast cancer in particular, but other kinds of cancer started going up dramatically. Diabetes went through the roof. And so you know, okay, this is not genetic. Mm -hmm. um, because genes didn't change. This is something about food, and it's about a Western diet, an animal-based diet. And it also meant that rice was not the cause of diabetes, um, because that's what they've been eating since time immemorial. Um, and there were also had been some studies in the U.S. of various populations, and it was already pretty clear that the more people followed a plant-based kind of diet, the healthier that they, they were. Um, so we had these inklings, and what had to happen really was to generate good hypotheses and, and then test them. And so that's what we have been doing. Mm -hmm. So at what point did PCRM go from an advocacy organization to a research organization? Was that a, was that a big step? Because I mean, I mean I've, I'm you know, involved right now in trying to do a, a very modest randomized clinical trial. And we've been going for six months and the fees keep increasing. Like, did yeah. at, 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 you know, at, 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 did you know what you were getting into at that point when you said we need to do our own research because no one else is doing it? Um, it's, you, I mean, you're right. It, it's doing, doing research well means being very careful. Um, and it often involves a lot of expense. And the first uh, study I did was a pilot study that I did with our friends at Georgetown University here in Washington, D.C. Um, there was a, a diabetes foundation uh, in Northern Virginia that actually came to me, and they said words that could have come out of my mouth. They said, we keep getting all these grant applications from people who want to do diabetes studies on rats and mice. And they, they, they said to me, I don't think that's right. I, 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 they, did not, they didn't want to do that. They said, there, there's got to be a better way. And I said, well, here's what you ought to be doing. What we ought to be doing is testing vegan diets for type 2 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes is 90, 95% of cases. Um, it's related to diet, and it's not caused by eating too much asparagus. It's from eating too much meat and cheese and, and fried foods and that kind of stuff. I said, let's do a study. So that was the first one, and uh, they paid for it, um, and which was good. Um, and it was highly successful. And so we started doing more studies, but, but we did them fairly inexpensively at, at first. <laughs> if, you're, if you see my office now, um, you wouldn't know that because we've got lots of expensive equipment and lots of staff now. But, um, but that's, that's what we've done. And, and we have many people who support us, who value the research that we're doing. And I'm happy to say that your tax dollars through the National Institutes of Health paid for, I think, our most important diabetes study. Um, that was through NIH. Now, because I know a lot of uh, of doctors and researchers and medical professionals who who are sympathetic to the idea that animal research isn't great, but almost to a to a man, and it is to, to a man, um, they feel it's necessary. So you know, I can and I can see like if you're doing you know new drug trials that you don't necessarily want to give them to people right away. But you were, you were talking about giving people food that has been shown to be healthy for thousands of years. Was that, is, you know, do you think you can do um, drug research without using uh, laboratory animals? Or do we not just, should we just stop doing drug research and just focus on the causes of disease? Well, we probably should stop a lot of it, I have to say. because No, you, we, shouldn't, we should not stop all drug research, although... There's a lot of it that does not need to be done. Um, uh, let me come back to your question in a second. Um, I first want to just parenthetically say that a lot of drug research is to make a new antidepressant uh, that's just kind of a... It's an exercise in marketing, not an exercise in something that's new for people, or a new uh, diabetes drug that doesn't really improve diabetes care. It's just it's a new company trying to make money. And there has been a tremendous... Um, effort over the past few decades 
to identify drugs. The pharmaceutical industry wants to identify drugs that you have to take for the rest of your life or that they can make you take for the rest of your life. So they're not interested in, in an antibiotic that you take for two weeks and then your sore throat's gone. They want you to be on something that you take forever. Hmm. Um, and it, it's because of money. It has nothing to do with what's what you really need. And they completely neglect the cause of things. So a new um, arthritis drug. They don't wrestle with the question of why do you have inflammation in your joints? What are you exposed to that could be triggering that? Rather, they will disable your immune system to a degree with biologicals so that you can pay them $10,000, $20,000 a year for the drug um, and you have trouble fighting off infections. Um, but they're making a lot of money. Um, can you do this work without animals? Um, yes, I think you can. There are some uh, uses of animals that are, are very, very easy to replace. There are some that are more challenging. Um, but I think that even if there, there are some that are quite challenging or difficult or you can't find the solution, that doesn't uh, relieve you of the um, obligation to find ways to replace that use of animals. Gotcha. Um, so your your first the big study um, with the, it was funded by the NIH in two thousand and six. Um, so that's that's the one I think that gets written up a lot. That, um, can you describe with what the hypothesis was and what what you felt you needed to do to right. to prove it? Because you know it's, I think it was like it was like a hundred people altogether or fifty. Ninety nine. Um, uh, we had already done the pilot study that I mentioned. Um, which we published in 1999 uh, in a journal called Preventive Medicine. It was really small. It was just a pilot study, um, but the results were very striking. And after that, we had done other studies uh, where we brought people in who did not have diabetes, but they were overweight, and we were using vegan diets and testing what happened in their bodies as they were as their weight was improving and so forth. And and so the hypothesis was that a low-fat, completely plant-based diet would reduce hemoglobin A1C, which is our uh, measure of blood sugar control, then it would reduce it better than the best current diet. And the, the, uh, the diets that people use now, for the most part, or, or we're using then, and still do to a degree, we're focused on two principles. One was eat less food. You're overweight, so count calories. Um, and the other thing was that blood sugar comes from carbohydrate, so don't eat too much carbohydrate, um, and keep the amount you eat sort of steady so that your medication doses don't have to change. And I thought, well, I'll bet we can do better. And so we brought in 99 people, and we split them between those two diets, a vegan diet versus a conventional diet. And as time went on, uh, and it was a long study. It was really, I think, just about the longest diet trial that you can do um, of this type. Uh, it, it was a year and a half. And um, we showed that when people follow the plant-based diet, they're, e e even those people where their medications were held absolutely constant, they didn't change their exercise or anything, um, the reduction in hemoglobin A1C was three times greater than in the conventional diet group. They lost a little bit more weight. Not, not a lot, but some more, despite the fact that they weren't counting calories at all. They're still losing a little bit more weight than the people who are counting calories. Um, their uh, cholesterol got better and improve more than the other groups. And so the question is, why are we telling people not to eat carbohydrate and not to eat rice and beans and starchy foods when we have a much better uh, approach? And then we also started to see people where the diabetes just completely went away. And that was a, an amazing thing, which I had not seen up until that point. Uh -huh. So that was a surprise that, that people became undiabetic? Uh, it, was, it was new for me. <laughs> And, and I, 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 I hasten to say that I don't think everybody's diabetes is going to go away. I think it's really a question of how soon we get to you. Um, so if a person has had diabetes for 35 years, um, their pancreas has been beaten up pretty badly. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, if I get you around the time you're diagnosed and we change your diet enough, um, you have a really good shot of getting rid of this disease and never having it come back. Mm. So you published the 2006 um, in what journal? Uh, Diabetes Care, which is published by the American Diabetes Association. They, they have two journals. They have one called Diabetes, which is really more the research journal, and Diabetes Care, which is their journal for um, that clinicians read on what's the latest in treatment. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful 
to the ADA for, for publishing our findings. Mm -hmm. So you know, at that point you had this, this study with very, very stark findings, uh, 18 months as opposed to a, you know, a six-week or 12-week trial that you'd do for, for the drug. Um, yeah. And what was the response from the medical community and the diabetes community in more particular? Well, I'm happy to tell you that the, the ADA was very good. I mean, they invited me to, to speak at their annual conference, and I, I spoke a few times there. And uh, every January, the Diabetes Care publishes their clinical practice guidelines. And so they have these recommendations for, for doctors, and they included vegan diets in them. Um, now, they have gotten a lot of um, other noise uh, from people who say, well, you could just do it Mediterranean or you could do it low carb. And, and they become uh, pretty democratic, um, a little bit more than I would like to see um, with all the different ways that a person can tackle diabetes. Um, uh, but, uh, but they've been open, open to this. Um, and um, I think the big issue that we have is and the big challenge we have is that a lot of practitioners are still using old fashioned methods and they don't have a, um, a structure in their practice for helping patients to change their diet. So they don't really give much attention to that. And the patient says, gee, I don't know what to do or, or, or I don't even want to change my diet or something like that. And the doctors just give up mm -hmm. and they don't, they don't educate the patient and encourage them and help them. All right. Well, anecdotally, I mean, I hear, I hear stories all the time about people, who go to their doctor and the doctor assures them that there's no way to reverse their diabetes yeah. or undo it. So it's not just, you know, they're, they're, they're unwilling to accept this new way or they don't think they have the behavioral tools. They're, they're not even aware of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's true. Yeah. Um, it happens all the time that the person who makes them aware of it is a patient um, who read my book or something like that. Um, in 2007, I think it was, I published a book with the, um, the name Dr. Neil Barnard's Program for Reversing Diabetes. And that got a lot of notice, and PBS picked it up as a, as a show that, that um, aired all over the place. And I got an email from a man who, uh, he was in England, and he had had diabetes, and it was getting worse. And um, his doctor uh, did some blood tests and, and so forth, and somewhere along the line, he picked up my book and he started reading it and he thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'll, let me try a vegan diet. Went back to his doctor's office. The doctor did, did more, more tests and he, he went home. And as soon as he got home, his phone rang. He sent me an email described telling me this whole story. His phone rang and it was the doctor's office. And they said, the doctor needs to see you immediately. Come back here to the doctor's office. And he panics. Like, what did they find in my blood? What have I got? How long do I have to live? What, what, and he's always driving to the doctor's office. He gets there, and the doctor says, come in, sit down. And the doctor asked him, I want you to tell me in detail what you have been doing. And so he said, well, you know, I, I, I read this book. I, I, I threw out all the animal products, and I've been keeping oils really low. And the doctor said, your blood tests are healthier than mine, and, and I don't have diabetes. <laughs> and, and so anyway, he, I mean, he could joke about it now, but... The, the, the guy's diabetes went away. And, of course, we see this all the time now. But the doctor was stunned, and he thought, how can this be? And we always were taught that it was a one-way street. But I, I hear this now all the time, that, that um, sometimes doctors tell little lies to themselves. Uh, my patients are lazy. Mm -hmm. They'd rather pop a pill. Um, I mean, that's not true. I mean, there is not a patient in the world who wouldn't take that whole pot of pills and throw it you know, in the trash if they thought that they could, could find a way to conquer this disease and get rid of it. They would do that. And although patient, everybody, every patient, and every, everybody is a little reluctant to change longstanding nutritional habits, people will do it. People are changing their diets every day anyway. They find new foods and new restaurants, and they're always trying new stuff. Um, when, you, when you encourage the patient and show them how to do this in a good and smart way, People will change. Uh, nobody wants to go blind or lose their kidneys or have their feet amputated from diabetes. And if if a diet change will save all of you from all those things, everybody will will embrace it, and they do. All right. So coming back to the research, you know, I've heard a lot of people 
um, whom I discuss slash argue with. I'll point to your study for diabetes. I'll point to Dr. Esselstyn's two published papers for uh, for heart disease, and people will say, "Well, that's you know, it's anecdotal. It's small numbers." Um, and I'll say, okay, well, may, maybe, but if this, was an, if this was a small number drug test, you would now have, you know, $50 million being poured into the, the full test for the new drug approval by the, by the FDA. What, do you think there's anything that still needs to be done in terms of research? Oh, or, sure. Or is this, is, at this point, is it mark, do we just have to market the same way, you know, Sanofi markets their, uh, their diabetes medicines? Well, let me come back. Uh, first of all, it's not small numbers. Um, these studies are done carefully, and they're done with adequate numbers, and the, the, the findings are good and solid. Um, and for, for people who are new to research, here's what you do. You set up your hypothesis. So I'm going to say uh, maybe a vegan diet is better than another diet for diabetes. And then you figure out how you're going to test that. All right, I'm going to, for X number of weeks, we're going to use the diets. And then you do what's called a power analysis, and that helps you to estimate the number of people that you will need in your study. And you, you can choose the number of people to show, all right, I want to prove this with 90% certainty. I want to prove it with 95% certainty. I want to prove it with 99% certainty, whatever. And so there are mathematical ways of telling you how many people you need in your study. And you sit down with your statisticians and they tell you. And then you figure out, well, what if some people drop out? And then you add extra to compensate for that. And that gives you your number. And so um, we did 99. I know it's a funny number, but that's what we, we did. Um, and it showed beyond, beyond really any reasonable doubt that this diet is good. And then um, after that, I mean, we've done many other studies, too. Um, we did a study with Geico, the, the car insurance company, mm-hmm. where we put the same diet um, to work at Geico facilities. And we did it in 10 different cities uh, across the United States. We did it in, in two different studies, but... But the first study was two cities. The second study was 10 cities. And we had hundreds of of participants. Um, And then we've done other studies where we looked at neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, which is a late stage. Uh, We've done it in just a normal endocrine practice to see how it worked there. And if you add all these people up, I mean, if you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and very convincing evidence. So, um, so no, um, we don't need any more research to just show is a, v, is a low-fat vegan diet good for diabetes? That's clear. But there are some other things where I think we do need more work. For example, let's apply this in children. There are now kids who are 14 years old, and they're gaining weight, and they're on crummy diets, and they're insulin resistant, and they're starting to get type 2 diabetes. There was one really good study at the Cleveland Clinic looking at kids uh, and using vegan diets for, for these at-risk kids. And it, it appears to be helpful, but we need to do much more there, not just to see if it works, because I think everyone believes it would work, but also to just see how do you apply it in a world where we have schools serving unhealthy foods and families kind of every night it's pepperoni pizza out of the freezer. And um, how to make this work in a translational setting where you translate it out of my research facility into some um, more challenging environments. Right. Yeah. Now, so you, know, you, you said you did an 18-month study, and it wasn't one of these where you lock people in a room and you feed them, so you can't control what they eat. Um, right. you, PCRM has your uh, Food for Life instructions. You have, um, you know, the kickstart. You have, you've done a lot of work with helping people ado- adopt this better diet. What, what have you learned through all the years about how to help people transition and, and be compliant? Um, uh, first, so I, sh- I should say maybe first, I don't actually use the word compliant. I, Good. I, use, a, I use a slightly <laughs> different word. Um, and the reason is comply means if you're going to comply, that means you're going to do what I tell you to do. It's like the word the ply as in fold yourself. You're going you're gonna, to um, do what I've asked you to do. That's not what I want you to do. I, I would I might use the word adherent, meaning you figured out what the diet is and you want to adhere to that diet or you don't want to. Um, and here's what I found. Uh, what I found is really good. Um, I have found that people will change their diets very happily, uh, provided you take what you know about the human animal and, and what they need in order to do that. So what, what I don't do 
is I don't encourage people to just make little steps. And I don't say, all right, you're, you're too old to change or, um, or you're from North Dakota, or you're from Texas, you couldn't possibly do this. No, anybody can, can make healthy diet changes. And so we have, we have evolved a method that we use and thousands of people here have done it. And, and I've, I've never seen anybody who can't do it. So, um, so you asked me what I've learned. I've learned to be a real optimist. Um, people will change. And, and also, um, food is like a drug for almost everybody. Uh, once in a while, people goof up. And I've learned not to get discouraged by somebody who, who messes up or is a little bit of a, of a recidivist. Um, because we see that with cigarettes and drugs and alcohol, it, people stutter their way into success. Um, so, no, we, we see lots of success and we have certain, as I mentioned, certain ways of helping people change their diets that, that work really well. Gotcha. Um, so one and by of the way, I have to say, um, when I'm in North Carolina in late October, um, I'm happy to say that I'm going to be talking, uh, at Duke, both of the medical students and I'm doing a grand rounds in the hospital. And so I'll be sharing these techniques with, uh, medical professionals and I, 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 I hope they find them useful. Awesome. Yeah, let's let's, let's talk about that because you're uh, you're coming to my neck of the woods um, mm-hmm. in October. So what's this is not the first event, but you've chosen Durham. I think it's your maybe it's your second or third. What's what's the event and what's the idea? Um, what are we've been sort of adopting metropolitan areas around the country. Um, we started out in Little Rock, um, and then we went to Rochester, New York, and, and St. Louis, and Detroit, and Atlanta. Um, where we show movies in the local theaters and we give lectures at the local hospitals and medical schools and we work with the restaurants and we work with the TV stations to say, let's get healthy together. And so, so um, we're going to work with um, Raleigh-Durham, Chapel Hill area, and say, all right, let's see what we can do to get healthy together. And it's totally positive and we pump everybody up. So um, on Saturday, October 27th, we're going to have what I'm going to call a health fest. It's at Panther Creek High School. And it's an all-day thing where people can come and see healthy products. And I'm going to be there. We're going to give lectures. And, and we're going to have some fun. But the night before that, on Friday, October 26th, we're going to show the movie Forks Over Knives, which for many people has been life-changing. But for many more, they've never seen it. And so it's at the Varsity Theater. Again, that's Friday, October 26th. And I hope everybody comes. And we might show, I, mean, I, I if I can work this out, I'm going to show a second film as a freebie that I think people are going to like. And then while I'm there, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking at the medical school um, at Duke. And um, we have a lot more things coming up. And so on our website at PCRM.org, you'll see those events uh, listed as uh, time approaches. And I hope people will drag their reluctant spouse out of the house and come and join us. Uh-huh. And so what kind of support are you getting from you know, community organizations and municipalities? Because, um, you know, we're, we're just uh, coming out of Hurricane Florence and aside from the, the human cost, there have been lots of, of, of reports of, you know, like tens of thousands of, of farm animals, of pigs uh, being drowned. So, you know, clearly we have our economy is largely based on killing and consuming animals. Um, do you, like what's what is the lay of the land in terms of, you know, the the business interests, the health interests, when you come in and try to negotiate this, this positive, healthy community-based message? Even, what you said is exactly right. But even bigger than the animal uh, agriculture interests are medical care. Um, who's, who, what's, what are the biggest buildings in, 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 in each town? You, walk, you go in there, and they are hospitals. Um, and so the economy is and not just there. I mean, this is true in Fargo when I go back home. I can't believe how the little Fargo clinic that my dad used to work at is now exploded into being the biggest employer in town. Hmm. Um, so the whole economy is based on everyone being really sick. Um, and so, uh, we, we have to change that. We can change that. And we have gotten really, really, I'm happy to say good support. I think my, my heart really goes out to all the people who, who not, not just in North Carolina, but, um, and frankly, not just from Florence, but from all the hurricanes that we've had. I mean, they're just devastating. But let's use this as a teachable moment. We can't stop every tragedy. But we know, for example, that all of those pigs 
um, who drowned, and all of that waste that's getting washed into into um, the streams and the rivers, that's completely unnecessary, and it's because we have this appetite for bacon and sausage and pork chops that, that does them no good and it does us no good, and it does our children no good because they end up having weight problems and cholesterol problems and a high risk of cancer. They wouldn't have any of that stuff if they were um, on healthier diets, or at least they wouldn't have it to the degree they do. Moreover, there is not an educated person on the planet who hasn't accepted that climate change is real. And when we were looking at hurricane flow and people were saying it, the warmer, the warming of the ocean waters um, and the warming of the atmosphere is accelerating the progress of this hurricane because the warmer it is and the, and the warmer, the warmer the water is, the more it, it, it keeps the um, winds moving, if I understand correctly. And the, the warmer the atmosphere is, the more water it can hold. So you have these torrential downpours. Um, now, there have always been storms, um, and there's always been some variability, but it's getting worse and worse and worse, and we are driving this. And I frankly don't know if we can stop it. Um, but the biggest contributor that is in our control is not capping smokestacks. Yes, we should do that, and yes, we should drive the most efficient cars and all that stuff. But... Animal agriculture is a bigger contributor to climate change than, than all transportation combined. Um, and for anyone who hasn't yet heard this message, here's what it is. You take all the cows in the United States, put them on one side of a balance, put all the humans on another side of the balance, and the cows outweigh us dramatically. We got, oh, 100 million of them, and each one is as big as a sofa. Um, they are there on dairy farms and meat farms. And every cow is belching methane coming out their mouth. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 by far. And so anybody watching this program who is still eating meat, still eating cheese, you have the power to change the climate for the better by deciding right now, I'm not going to do that anymore. And by bringing our family along. And when parents are watching this thinking, you know, if I, if, my, if I raise my child on a vegan diet, not only will they be healthier, probably a better athlete, but we're going to be working together so that there is a planet for them to live in in the future. That's what we need to do. So if we just say, all right, let's board up our homes again. Let's try to make bigger, bigger uh, levies next time. We are squandering the most important teachable moment that we have. And that the lesson is to have a healthier plant-based diet. Yeah. And, you know, even, even if I could, you know, board up my home, um, you know, we've been gardening where we are for, for 15 years now. We have fire ants that we didn't used to have. We have, we have um, you know, blights on our uh, grapevine that we didn't used to have. We, the, you know, things are budding in the wrong season. We have blueberry, our blueberry bushes are budding in February and then getting killed off by frost. Like... <laughs> There's, you know, you, you, PCRM has sort of, you know, wandered into forbidden territory into public health, you know, which um, like most you know, in, in sort of medical circles, there's like you know, pretty clear demarcations. Are you doing clinical work or are you doing public health? And, and I love I just love the inclusiveness of your approach. I'm, I wonder if it's cost you sort of credibility from the silos that you're, yeah, you know, that, but, but I just, I just, I just love that you're looking at this whole picture of how can humans and this beautiful planet be well. Um, no, I, I don't think, I, I don't think it's cost us any credibility. And, and if anything, we have more and more allies. I mean, let, let's face it. Um, if you are a doctor, you're also hopefully a thinking person who is not just a patient comes in to see you. The, the patient is a 40-year-old man. You're diagnosing him with diabetes. You give him a prescription, you send him out the door. Wait, stop. If you are a, a good doctor and a thinking person, you recognize he's got a family. And the family is at risk for problems, too, because they're all eating together. So you say, maybe we should, should talk to you, not just you about your medications. Let's talk to you about your diet. And let's talk about what their diet is. So you're treating the, the, the family. And at some point, doctors have to also look at the fact you live in a city somewhere or you live in a rural area that's being affected by things too. So our role as, as, uh, as physicians and all the people we ally with 
has to be to speak out against the things that are that are threatening us. And it's funny, uh, some of the biggest pe people, doctors who are complaining about climate change now are allergists. They're saying, my whole practice is dramatically changed for just the reasons that you said, because the climate is changing and plants are coming into bloom in a different way than they did before. So we're seeing these effects all over the place. Um, to tell you the truth, I also feel that if I'm dealing with a 19-year-old patient, they're going to live forever. Um, they're, um, they're immortal as far as they're concerned. But on the other hand, if the environment is what motivates them to change their diet, hmm. then their coronary arteries are going to benefit too. So don't waste those motivators. If, if you've got a 12-year-old kid who becomes a vegan because he doesn't want to kill animals, that is great motivation. So use all those motivations. They're going to end up uh, keeping your patients healthy. Great, great. You know, it's, I mean, and folks who uh, who see me in a strange background, I'm in Austin, Texas, for a meeting of the Self-Insured Institute of America. There's a lot of doctors here and a lot of uh, visionaries who are trying to save health care. And almost all of them are focused on things like um, – you know, reference-based pricing um, on, you know, finding, you know, lower cost solutions on bringing transparency to the market. And, you know, me and Olivia Kelly and Wellstart are really the only ones talking about less utilization, about needing less health care. So this is, you know, this is a pretty uh, progressive organization looking to fix health care, and they're missing the 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 plot. Um, so how 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 is PCRM um, positioning itself over the next decade or hundred years or how, however however long you, your your vista um, to really change the conversation for doctors for healthcare professionals and for consumers? A couple of years ago, we started a, a, a clinic here, a medical clinic here, a primary care clinic, um, and I have to tell you the reason I did that is we were doing research studies and people wanted to be in our studies because they thought that's where I'll get healthy. Um, but I only had so many places for people. So we started a primary care clinic where anybody can come. And so we have doctors and nurse practitioners and dietitians. And um, our model is, is, is very much an orthodox model where you know we, we take all insurances and people come in and we'll give them regular medical care, except that um, we have a huge emphasis on nutrition because when a person comes to us with a weight problem, diabetes, a cholesterol problem, or hypertension, which is frankly, these are the biggest problems that doctors are dealing with, we know that the, the nutrition is the cause of all of that. So um, the doctor will see the patient and they don't need to take a lot of time necessarily. They need to look at the blood tests and talk with the patient about the condition. But then they have to, to refer the patient to the registered dietitian who will take an hour or more with the patient to meet with a spouse or partner. And you go over what they're eating and you make out a, make a plan. And then the patient is a little nervous about, gee, now I'm going to have to make some changes. We have classes that are set up that the pa they're already structured. And so uh, you say, would you like to come on Mondays at six or Thursdays at two, um, which works better for you. And they can come to classes for free forever. And we have other medical practices sending their patients to us for the nutrition side of things because we can keep their patients healthier by, um, by partnering uh, on the food side of things. Now, some people will still, still need medications, and that's okay. But as long as we're putting as much effort into tackling the nutritional causes of illness um, as we are into trying to mop up all the consequences, um, then we're on onto, I think, a pretty good medical model. Mm. And before, before I let you go, I almost made it to the Plantrician Conference in San Diego. Uh, Florence uh, got in my way, but I talked to people who went there. And one of the big issues, the, the big hungers for enlightened, evidence-based doctors who understand the power of plant-based nutrition is they're looking for practice models that will allow them to support themselves and lead um, you know, satisfactory, abundant lives. Have, have, do you feel like uh, the Barnard Clinic has, uh, has figured stuff out that, that other people can replicate? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, now, now, don't get me wrong. Doctors have all kinds of other challenges with reimbursement. And, and frankly, I think doctors' salaries are too high. I think they should get paid less. Um, 
And if, if we do all that, I think clinics will um, work more affordably. And medications cost too much. I think the pharmaceutical companies are making too much money. Um, and I think you, we have not solved all of those issues. But on the treatment side, yeah, I, I, think, I think we have a, a very, very good model. And in fact, um, our conference, uh, which is called the International Conference for Nutrition in Medicine, which occurs every summer. Um, in fact, the next one is, I think it's uh, July 26th or 27th of 2019, right here in Washington, D.C., um, we, that's one of the central things that we talk about is uh, practice models. And so we always have practitioners who are doing a, a great job come to the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. They have a great, great time with it. We have other tools, too. Uh, we give away uh, our book. It's called The Nutrition Guide for Clinicians. We give it away free of charge to medical students every year. And the third edition is about to come out, and it is now on your handheld. So you can get it on your iPad or your phone. Um, and it's free. The, the uh, Nutrition Guide for Clinicians is a free app, free download. Um, our Kickstart program is also free. We've had 600,000 people go through it in English and Spanish and Mandarin. And we have a program for people from you know, the Indian subcontinent with all Indian recipes. Um, and uh, that's free. It's, that's called the 21-day uh, the vegan Kickstart. And it's got its uh, iPhone app and its Android app. So I hope people take advantage of these various uh, resources. I hope they go to the library and pick up my books, The Cheese Trap, or some of my other books, and and share what they read with their family. Yeah. Now, but, uh, yeah. Before I let you go, that I've I've heard you give the Cheese Trap lecture. I think three or four times, and I keep wanting to like put it on a flash disk and stick it in the back of people's heads, like Neo from the Matrix. Is <laughs> is is it available? Is there a definitive? Um, YouTube version of that, or do people have to get your book? Or? Uh, well, I, I hope they'll go to the library and check out that book and share it with their family and, and <laughs> fluff up a pillow for their spouse and read to them uh, every night before they go to bed. Um, I don't. I, I, I imagine it's on YouTube. Um, if you go on YouTube, you'll see a whole lot of lecture videos, um, as well as some music videos. As you, you might have noticed as well, um, and uh, there are hundreds of them. So I, I hope that that is up there. Okay, great. So um, people can just go to PCRM.org and follow the links to everything, but also I'll also include some of the relevant links on the show notes for this episode. Um, so Dr. Neil Barnard, I really I look forward to seeing you um, in October down in, uh, in Raleigh-Durham on, the sat Sunday, on sat Friday the 26th at the Varsity Theater and Sunday at the, uh, Saturday the 27th at Panther Creek. Um, so I hope, I hope everyone who's listening from my local area comes out and, and drags at least several of your friends. And um, thank you so much for all the work you do and for taking the time today. Well, it's been great talking with you, and I look forward to seeing you and, and seeing uh, many more new friends um, in about a month's time. So thanks a lot. Right on. Take care. All right. Well, that was another opportunity for me to put on my big boy pants and not be too much of a fanboy. But honestly, the chance to have an hour long one on one conversation with Dr. Neil Barnard is definitely one of the highlights of this podcast for me. So if you found it to be a highlight of your week and you would like to support the mission of this podcast, one thing you can do just take a couple of minutes is to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you consume your podcast. That really helps us in the rankings get noticed and spread the message beyond the people who already agree with everything that Dr. Barnard and I said. So again, if you want to find out more about WellStart Health and the upcoming program, go to wellstarthealth.com slash program. And be sure to check out the show notes for today's episode with links to all that good PCRM stuff at plantyourself.com slash 291. And you'll also find there a uh, YouTube video embedded right there. You can watch the whole thing. If you're new here, you can catch up on 290 archived episodes over at plantyourself.com. Oh, and before I forget, I want to 
send out huge appreciation to all the folks who are supporting this show on Patreon. This was my first check this month of more than $550, which means I'm more than halfway to the first stretch goal of $1,000 a month to help offset the costs of producing this podcast and especially the cost of my time. This takes many hours a week away from the things that I do to try to build Wellstart, to uh, support clients, to make money. And this really started out and has continued as a labor of love. And it's nice to get love back. I, I love getting love back in the form of feedback, in the form of reviews, in the form of emails. Uh, HJ at plantyourself.com if you'd like to send one my way. But money is a very tangible exchange of energy, and it feels really nice. So if you'd like to uh, engage in that exchange, you can do so at plantyourself.com. Just scroll down on the right sidebar, you will see a button that says Patreon, and you can go there and put in an ongoing monthly contribution. And you get all sorts of goodies when you do that, even for just a dollar a month. All right, garden news. We have more pesto. Apparently, a whole bunch of volunteer basil plants have emerged in the garden. We were doing some weeding and discovered them. And so it's back to uh, pesto. One last hurrah. We think, based on the drooping goldenrods in the front pine forest, that we may be getting a frost in the next week or two. And so that would end the basil. In running news, I had a strong run this morning, totally by accident. I was running, and there was a guy running in the other direction whom I've never seen before. And we started running together. And damn if he wasn't doing 820, 830, and then 730 miles. So I did three miles at a pace that I haven't done in a while. And then what was cool was after he went home, I was running back. And I was going at what I thought was a much slower pace. And I glanced at my watch and I was still about a 9.15. So it was like, you know, tearing off the cobwebs by doing a, a fast run with someone else that I was trying to keep up with and impress. So I'm looking forward to getting back into marathon training, maybe Louisiana in January. All right, time for thanks. Thanks, of course, to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use Sabali Don, the Dance of Peace, as the theme music for this show. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons, especially those of you who helped push us over the top, over that 550 mark. I can taste a thousand. I can taste the self-sufficiency of this podcast. I can even taste maybe hiring someone to help me do some of it. Because right now, as... Uh, incompetent as I am with the technology, with the marketing, with the promotion, with all the things that aren't being um, in front of people and talking to them, all this other stuff that I'm mediocre at at best, boy, it'd be fun to get somebody who knows what they're doing to help uh, grow the show. So um, anyway, thanks to all of you folks, as in... Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Mara, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherly, Mary Jean Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Burns, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Aaron, Jen Falkenowski, David Bosnick, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Victoria Dolman, Olive, Leah Stoller, Leah Stoller, sorry, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrew, Josina, Julianne Rollins, Stu Dolnick, Sarah Durkis, Run the Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Peterson, Leanne Peterson, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Stump Franz, Jeanette Bedham, Gila Lester, David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Doron of of Gio and Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesen, Ruth Ann Thunderbrook, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, the equally mysterious Tracy Z, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lindemann rhymes with cinnamon. Nick Harper, Stephanie Almost, Martha Bergner, Nicole Ramsey, Susan Amon, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R. Susan Laverty, the Panda Beacon, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Heather, Harry, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh. Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Ashley Corker, and Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch, and Plant Happy Organ, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Shell Rootless, Julian Watkins, Breed O'Connell, Brian Sheridan, Shannon Hirschman, Kate Rolls, Linda Ayat, Julie Lang, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzin, Wakani, Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Aviva L. Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Orlikoski of Plant Powered for Health. God. Oh. It was tough today. Karen Smith, Scott Morani, Karen and Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Kelly Baker, Miracle Land, Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Divot, Joshua Sommermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Deb Cassia, Cassia, man. Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Picorni, Stephen Leenan, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Donna Kartz, and Deanne Bishop. For your generous support of the podcast. That's it for this week. As always, be well, my friends.
All right, time for thanks. Thanks to Will Reidenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willreidenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Maurer, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Mr. Cobb, Rachel Behrens, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jennifer Kinoski, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Landry, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes of Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, Janet Selby, hi Janet, Claire Adams, Tom Franzak, Jeanette Benham, Gil David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Dorona Viso, Gio and Carl, Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesen, Ruth Ann Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, the equally mysterious Tracy Z, Aviva L, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harper, Martha Bergner, Susan Amads, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R, Susan Laverty, the Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Kelly Machia, Dean Norton, Bonnie Lynch, at Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Cobble, Julian Rodkins, Breed O'Connell. Shannon Hirschman, Linda Ayat, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainlein, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olakoski of Plant Powered for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen Joe Crabtree, Tanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazleton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justin Divich, Joshua Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Bacorny, Stephen Lehman, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Donna Karts, Dean Bishop, Bill Brielf, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trisha Adams, Ian Kramer, Len, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bayshore, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gulledge, Laura Heaton, Meg from Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parang Ganshi, Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt, Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Olga Sidorowska, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught of Edible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sawyer Nayak, Erica Piedra, Danielle Roberts, Michael Lushton, and Sarah Johnson for your your generous support of the podcast. That's it for now. As always, be well, my friends.